Hello and welcome to GI 101. My name is Dr. Adriana Lazarescu and I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. In this podcast series, we will be discussing common clinical problems that arise from the GI tract. With me in the GI 101 studios today is my co-host, Dr. Dan Sadowski. Hi, Dan. Hello. What are we talking about today? Well, for the past few weeks, we've been talking a lot about the esophagus and dysphagia. And so I thought it would be useful to spend today's session talking about how we actually assess the motility of the esophagus. What is an esophageal manometry study? So an esophageal manometry study is an assessment of esophageal pressures in response to swallowing. And this is typically done by inserting a catheter with pressure sensors along its length through the nose, down the esophagus, and across the LES to the stomach. Then we have the patient swallow liquid boluses, and we measure the pressure response in the esophagus. And for our listeners, I hope you can see some of the uh, slides that are attached to this podcast. You can see in this slide how motility has been done for a, for a number of years with uh, a pressure catheter with four to five leads measuring um, the pressures at different sites in the esophagus and at the lower esophageal sphincter. And you can see that there's actually a problem with this method in that there's large gaps in between the pressure sensors, meaning that there's a lot of information about the pressure behavior in the esophagus that's missing. Now, fortunately, we have high resolution esophageal manometry. And in this slide, you can see a modern esophageal pressure catheter that actually has 36 pressure sensors down its length. And so this generates a lot more data and a much more accurate description of the pressure behavior in the esophagus. And so the old pressure line graph that has been typically done in the past for esophageal manometry studies has been replaced with a spatial temporal plot. And this plot sort of looks like a weather map. And you can see in this slide uh, the display of a typical esophageal manometry study. And in this setting, pressure is actually represented by color. And so the more intense the color, as, as you move from blue through yellow up to red, the higher the pressure. So with this technique, we get a very accurate assessment of the lower esophageal sphincter resting pressure. We actually are able to measure the ability of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax in response to swallows. We also determine if peristalsis is present or not. And by peristalsis, we mean the sequential squeezing movement of the esophagus from top to bottom. So we can actually calculate the uh, peristaltic velocity and its amplitude. And we also measure or assess for the presence of spasm in the esophagus as well. So what are the main indications for an esophageal manometry study? So the most common situation where we use esophageal manometry is when we are evaluating motor type cases of dysphagia. We also use it to aid in the placement of intraluminal devices such as a Bravo probe or if we're doing a 24-hour pH and it's important to know where the lower esophageal sphincter is. It's commonly ordered prior to surgery for gastroesophageal reflux disease and for evaluation of non-cardiac chest pain. Are there any contraindications to having an esophageal manometry study? In general, not really. This is a very safe test. Um, however, uh, it can be difficult to do the procedure in patients who have had uh, nasal fractures or deviated septum just because it's difficult to actually place the catheter through the nose. It should not be done in patients who have esophageal varices for fear of precipitating bleeding. And it should be done with caution in patients who have known esophageal strictures or diverticula. So what kind of diagnoses can you make with an esophageal manometry study? So there are a wide range of esophageal motor disorders that we can actually detect uh, with this technique. Uh, let me just show you some slides that illustrate some of the findings that we see. In this slide, we can see a patient that has a low esophageal sphincter pressure. You can see the band at the bottom of the slide is not very intense. That is, it's, 
It's not even green, it's slightly blue. In this slide, we see a patient that has a chalasia, and this has been the topic of several previous uh, podcast episodes. An achalasia, you'll recall, has an absent LES relaxation, as you see in this uh, slide, uh, no relaxation of the LES in response to swallows, and totally absent peristalsis within the body of the esophagus. In this slide, we see uh, ineffective esophageal motility, where the peristaltic contractions are, are very weak and of low amplitude. And sometimes we use the term scleroderma-type esophagus when this ineffective esophageal motility is particularly severe. Here's an example of an esophageal spasm, a simultaneous uh, contraction in the distal esophagus, and these are often associated with perceived pain by the patient. In this slide, we see an example of nutcracker esophagus, where the peristaltic amplitude uh, in response to swallows is actually quite high, in this case more than 300 millimeters of mercury. These are patients who often present either with dysphagia or with chest pain. Thanks, Dan. That was a great description of an esophageal manometry study. To our listeners, the summary for today's podcast is that esophageal manometry is a useful test for investigating patients with dysphagia suspected to be due to a motor disorder. We hope that you have found today's podcast useful. Please join us next week for another episode of GI 101. Bye.